Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Chris, and today we're delving into Chapter 5 of S. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. Chapter 5 concludes just hours after Chapter 4. Nick arrives home at 2 a.m., presumably after dropping off Jordan Baker and smashing the like button. If you could just take a moment and hit that like button, it really helps in the YouTube algorithm. If you're finding value in this video, by hitting the like button, YouTube will be more likely to show this video to other people who will find it beneficial. Nick arrives home at 2 a.m. and at first he thinks his house is on fire, but then he's like, oh, it's not. It's just that the light from Gatsby's mansion is so bright that it is illuminating the entire neighborhood and it makes it look like there is a fire. Every single light is on in Gatsby's mansion, but there is no music. There is no party guest. No one is at Gatsby's mansion except Gatsby. Gatsby walks across Nick's lawn and when Nick says, hey, every light is on in your mansion, Gatsby says, I have been glancing into some of the rooms. <laughs> okay. Gatsby then suggests that he and Nick go to Coney Island, which is an amusement park at 2 a.m. When Nick declines, Gatsby suggests that they jump into Gatsby's swimming pool at 2 a.m. Nick says he wants to go to bed, and then Gatsby just stands there. It's clear Nick wants to leave, but Gatsby doesn't say anything. He just stands there. It's kind of an awkward moment. The point is, Gatsby is nervous. He is on pins and needles. Think about how in chapter four, we learned that Gatsby has been plotting a reunion with Daisy for five years. He knows that earlier this afternoon, Nick had tea with Jordan. Jordan told Nick all about Gatsby and Daisy and asked Nick to host a reunion at his cottage between Gatsby and Daisy. Gatsby's entire plan hinges on what Nick says next. Nick says he'll invite Daisy over to tea and Gatsby plays it cool. He acts like it's not that big of a deal and that he doesn't want to inconvenience Nick. Remember in chapter four, Gatsby was really forward and asked Nick an awkward question when he said, what's your opinion of me? Gatsby is forward again here in chapter five. Gatsby randomly says, why I thought, why look here, old sport, you don't make much money, do you? Gatsby is immediately trying to return Nick's favor. This is a characteristic of new money people. New money people see other people as pawns, as tools for their own personal benefit. Therefore, they don't believe that other people would perform favors out of the kindness of their heart or mutual admiration. They think everything is done for a selfish reason. Gatsby doesn't want his plan to derail, and so Gatsby wants to remain in Nick's good graces. The next morning, Nick calls Daisy and invites her to tea, and Nick warns Daisy, don't bring Tom. What? Don't bring Tom. Who is Tom? She asked innocently. This moment is reminiscent of chapter one and how all throughout chapter one, Daisy tries to project this facade of being very carefree and lighthearted. And so here she's joking about her husband. When the big day arrives, it is pouring rain. Gatsby looks exhausted. He is pale. Gatsby almost leaves Nick's cottage. He declares, nobody's coming to tea. It's too late. I can't wait all day. Just as Gatsby says that, there is a knock at the door. Nick goes outside and greets Daisy. And here, Nick describes, once again, Daisy's voice. The exhilarating ripple of her voice was a wild tonic in the rain. I had to follow the sound of it for a moment, up and down, with my ear alone, before any words came through. Notice it is the musical quality of Daisy's voice that makes the first impression before the listener comprehends the words. So it's the effect Daisy's voice has on other people that's most important, not necessarily what she's saying. Nick invites Daisy into the house and they walk into the living room and it is empty. Gatsby has vanished. There is now another knock at the door. Nick opens the door and narrates, Gatsby, pale as death, with his hands plunged like weights in his coat pockets, was standing in a puddle of water, glaring tragically into my eyes. This passage is dripping with foreshadowing. I don't wanna spoil anything, 
So for right now, I'll just focus on the fact that Gatsby is soaking wet. Gatsby enters the cottage and walks into the living room. Nick kind of hangs back for a moment and gives Gatsby and Daisy a private moment, but obviously Nick is eavesdropping. And Nick narrates, for half a minute, there wasn't a sound. Then from the living room, I heard a sort of choking murmur and part of a laugh followed by Daisy's voice on a clear artificial note. I certainly am awfully glad to see you again. Daisy's voice is described as being artificial, fake. Nick then enters the living room and there's some really strained, awkward conversation between Gatsby and Daisy. And then Nick decides to leave and give them some more private alone time. And as Nick starts to leave, suddenly Gatsby exclaims, where are you going? I've got to speak to you about something before you go. And Gatsby gets up and follows Nick into the kitchen. And Gatsby's like, this is a terrible mistake. Nick kind of gives Gatsby a pep talk here. Nick says, you know, you're just embarrassed and it's normal. And guess what? Daisy's embarrassed too. And Gatsby is shocked to hear that Daisy's embarrassed. Like it never crossed his mind. And then Nick tells Gatsby he's acting like a boy. And so that's the moment Gatsby gathers himself, fortifies himself, and he goes back into the living room. But I just, I just love the moment where Nick scolds Gatsby like he's a little schoolboy, kind of like an awkward middle school romance. After Gatsby disappears into the living room, Nick goes outside, and then after some time passes, Nick re-enters his cottage. And as, as Nick enters his cottage, he tries to make a lot of noise because he's announcing his presence. Like he doesn't want to walk into a private, emotional moment, so he's trying to give Daisy and Gatsby a heads up. There is a complete change in the atmosphere, whereas it was really formal and awkward before, now all of the embarrassment is gone. Daisy has been crying, and Gatsby is described as glowing. Gatsby looks out the window and says, what do you think of that? It stopped raining. And Daisy responds, I'm glad, Jay. Her throat, full of aching, grieving beauty, told only of her unexpected joy. Is Daisy really talking about the rain here or is she talking about the disappointment in her life? Just as the clouds are now clearing, maybe the disappointment is clearing from her life. Her marriage to Tom has not been the most supportive and fulfilling marriage and so maybe she feels as if it is a new day. Seeing this, this old lover of hers fills her suddenly with a sense of optimism. Gatsby invites both Daisy and Nick to come tour Gatsby's mansion. While Daisy disappears to wash her face, Nick and Gatsby have a curious conversation. They're standing outside, they're sort of admiring Gatsby's mansion in the distance, and Gatsby says, it took me just three years to earn the money that bought it. Nick replies, I thought you inherited your money. I did, old sport, but I lost most of it in the big panic, the panic of the war. Notice this contradicts what we learned in chapter four when Gatsby claimed that he was the son of a wealthy family, all dead now. Here he's saying he actually had to work to buy the mansion. Now it's time to go to Gatsby's mansion and remember Nick's lawn and Gatsby's lawn touch. So the shortest walking distance would be simply just to walk across Nick's backyard to Gatsby's mansion. But no, no, no. Gatsby decides they are to walk along Nick's driveway, go to the main road, walk along the main road, and then enter Gatsby's driveway. Gatsby is once again displaying behavior typical of new money. He is being very ostentatious with his wealth. He wants Daisy to enter from the main road so that in front of her, as she looks down the driveway, she's getting the full effect of all of the gardens, the grounds, the landscaping, and then at the end of the driveway, sitting there is Gatsby's magnificent mansion. It's almost as if Gatsby is a photographer and he wants to frame the scene. And so he wants Daisy to view it for the maximum impact, to impress her. This is a perfect moment to pause and turn back to the title page of the novel. So on the title page, it says F. Scott Fitzgerald, The Great Gatsby. And then underneath that, it appears there is a stanza from the poem. This is called a epigram. Then wear the gold hat, if that will move her. If you can bounce high, bounce for her too. Till she cry, lover, gold-hatted high-bouncing lover. 
I must have you. It is about romance. It is about impressing the girl. The speaker here is imploring the man to wear a gold hat. If you wear a gold hat, if you project your wealth, it will move the girl. Move here means cause an emotional reaction in. But you don't want to just show your wealth. You need to bounce high. Bounce for her too. Here, bouncing means upward movement. Remember in chapter four, in the bridge scene, Nick describes the rising city, the progress and the economic prosperity in New York City. So you need to bounce and move higher and higher up the socioeconomic ladder. And here, bounce also means show enthusiasm and romance towards the girl. So if you do that, if you have a high ranking position in society, if you have wealth, if you show romance towards the girl, she will cry, I must have you. Notice Gatsby is trying to do this with Daisy. That's the whole point of this moment in chapter five, when he, he, he has just been reunited with Daisy. And the next thing he wants to do is come look at my mansion, at my possessions, look at what I have earned. Gatsby, Daisy and Nick tour Gatsby's mansion. They go through all of the rooms Nick notices during this tour, Gatsby keeps watching Daisy's face. Nick narrates, he hadn't once ceased looking at Daisy, and I think he revalued everything in his house according to the measure of response it drew from her well-loved eyes. Sometimes too, he stared around at his possessions in a dazed way. Gatsby's watching Daisy's reaction to all of Gatsby's possessions, and he's re-evaluating them. Meaning if Daisy looks like she really likes something, then Gatsby is now going to really like that possession. But if Daisy sort of dismisses and doesn't seem to like something, then Gatsby is no longer going to like it. We've now arrived at one of the most talked about parts in the entire book. They go into Gatsby's closet and Gatsby has a collection of very fancy shirts. They are from England. Gatsby has a personal shopper in England who twice a year purchases these fashionable expensive shirts and ships them all the way to New York. Gatsby begins to take the shirts one by one and throw them at Nick and Daisy. Daisy suddenly breaks down and starts to cry. Daisy sobs. They're such beautiful shirts. It makes me sad because I've never seen such such beautiful shirts before. People always wonder, why is Daisy crying over these shirts? It's not about the shirts. Earlier today, Daisy showed up at her cousin's house expecting to have tea with him. And then suddenly, this long lost lover appears. Someone she has not talked to for five years. Remember, this is before the internet. You can't keep tabs on people. You can't scroll through your Facebook feed and see what's happening. She has no idea what happened to Gatsby, where he's been, what his life has been like. He suddenly just waltzes into the room. It must have been this very overwhelming sensation for Daisy. Furthermore, there was that detail earlier in the book how Daisy's mother disapproved of the relationship, and we could infer it was because of wealth and social status. So Daisy has now toured Gatsby's mansion. She has seen all of the lavish, and expensive possessions. She now understands Gatsby is rich. She can now entertain the notion that maybe a relationship would work between them because Gatsby can provide her a financially secure life. So all of this just coalesces, all of these feelings and experiences just hit Daisy in this moment. So she's not literally crying because Gatsby has nice shirts, She's crying because the situation is overwhelming and unexpected. Nick and Daisy start to look at this picture of Gatsby from when he was 18 years old and he's standing on a yacht. And Daisy exclaims, I adore it, the pompadour. You never told me you had a pompadour or a yacht. Daisy is complimenting Gatsby's hair, but then she also makes the assumption that at age 18, Gatsby owned a yacht, yet another material object. Suddenly the phone rings, Gatsby answers it and says, yes. Well, I can't talk now. I can't talk now, old sport. I said a small town. He must know what a small town is. 
Well, he's no use to us if Detroit is his idea of a small town. And then Gatsby slams down the phone. Hmm, what's that all about? Remember in chapter three, Gatsby was getting random phone calls from Philadelphia and Chicago. Gatsby then asks his house guest, Cliff Springer, to play the piano so they can all dance. Nick decides it is time for him to leave and leave Gatsby and Daisy alone. And as Nick leaves, he narrates, as I went over to say goodbye, I saw that the expression of bewilderment had come back into Gatsby's face, as though a faint doubt had occurred to him as to the quality of his present happiness. Almost five years. There must have been moments, even that afternoon, when Daisy tumbled short of his dreams, not through her own fault, but because of the colossal fatality of his illusion. It had gone beyond her, beyond everything. He had thrown himself into it with a creative passion, adding to it all the time, decking it out with every bright feather that drifted his way. No amount of fire or freshness can challenge what a man will store up in his ghostly heart. Nick perceives here that Gatsby is filled with a faint doubt, meaning like a thought that's in your subconscious and it's slowly starting to work its way towards the surface. And this doubt has something to do with illusion versus reality. Gatsby took that October of 1917, he took that version of Daisy and froze it. And for five years, that's how he's thought of Daisy. And while Gatsby has been plotting and planning for this moment, and everything he has done is to try and win back Daisy, meanwhile, Daisy has been living a life for five years. And you and I, we change with every experience we have, with every friendship, we gain, with every romance we encounter, with every class we take at school, with every job we take, everything changes us. Five years from now, we will not be the same people. Gatsby's having this nagging sensation that Daisy isn't quite what he remembered. At the end of chapter five, mission accomplished, Gatsby is with Daisy and they will live happily ever after. Oh wait, we are only halfway through the book. What could possibly go wrong? Daisy is married to Tom, they have a child, and Gatsby is behaving as if the past five years never occurred. Which brings us to a motif that is repeated all throughout chapter five and the novel, which is this motif of time. So if we back up to earlier in chapter five, when Gatsby first enters the living room and greets Daisy, he's posing by the fireplace mantle. You know, he's trying to project this very cool image and he accidentally knocks the clock from the mantle and it almost hits Gatsby on the head. Time is literally hitting Gatsby. Then on that tour of the mansion where we talked about how Gatsby was reevaluating his possessions based on Daisy's reaction, right around there, Nick narrates, he had passed visibly through two states and was entering upon a third. After his embarrassment and his unreasoning joy, he was consumed with wonder at her presence. He had been full of the idea so long, dreamed it right through to the end, waited with his teeth set, so to speak, at an inconceivable pitch of intensity. Now, in the reaction, he was running down like an overwhelmed clock. While Gatsby has been watching Daisy's face, Nick has been watching Gatsby's face. And Nick decides that Gatsby has progressed through three emotions throughout the day. So at first Gatsby was embarrassed, then he was joyful, now he is just consumed with wonder at Daisy's presence. Here in front of him is the woman in the flesh that he has dreamed about for so long. It's a miracle. Then Nick compares Gatsby to an overwhelmed clock as if a clock is malfunctioning, it's not keeping proper time. Maybe Gatsby's mind has created this malfunctioning version of Daisy and how Gatsby has imagined Daisy would be a certain way, but in reality, she's completely different and it's causing this clash between reality and illusion. In his reunion with Daisy, Gatsby has lost something. Gatsby says to Daisy, if it wasn't for the mist, we could see your home across the bay. 
You always have a green light that burns all night at the end of your dock. Nick then narrates, Daisy put her arm through his abruptly, but he seemed absorbed in what he had just said. Possibly it had occurred to him that the colossal significance of that light had now vanished forever. Compared to the great distance that had separated him from Daisy, it had seemed very near to her, almost touching her. It had seemed as close as a star to the moon. Now it was again a green light on a dock. His count of enchanted objects had diminished by one. The green light at the end of the dock no longer represents Daisy. It no longer represents Gatsby's pursuit. Whereas that green light has motivated Gatsby for so long, now it has lost its significance. It's just a light. It's just a navigation tool to prevent boats from crashing into the dock. That green light was an enchanted object. It was this magical thing that was motivating Gatsby and giving him purpose. At the very end of chapter five, Nick does feel like a third wheel, so he does leave. Nick's last image of Gatsby and Daisy together here, Nick narrates, his hand took hold of hers, and as she said something low in his ear, he turned towards her with a rush of emotion. I think that voice held him most with its fluctuating, feverish warmth, because it couldn't be overdreamed. That voice was a deathless song. Then I went out of the room and down the marble steps into the rain, leaving them there together. It is now raining again, and all of chapter five is soaking wet. Gatsby is covered in water. There was that brief pause in the rain, but now here at the end, it is raining again. Perhaps a little bit of foreboding that the storms are returning, the conflict and the tumult in Gatsby and Daisy's life will return. It's not going to be all smooth sailing. Once again, we're only halfway through the book, so something's got to happen. But also notice the prevalence of water in the entire novel. West Egg and East Egg are peninsulas that jut out into the water, into the Long Island Sound. For so long, Gatsby looked across that water towards the green light at the end of Daisy's dock. And here, Nick said Daisy's voice was a deathless song. This is a reference to Greek mythology and the sirens. Sailors at sea would hear these enchanting voices and they would think to themselves, I need to see the women singing these songs. These voices are so beautiful. And so they would sail towards the voices, but then their ships would crash and they would die. So no one actually knows what the sirens look like. The implication here is that Daisy's voice is drawing Gatsby towards danger. And that concludes chapter six. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button. It will help other people discover this video. If you have any lingering questions about chapter five, let me know in the comments and I'll try to help you out. In the next video, we'll cover chapter six in which Daisy finally attends one of Gatsby's parties along with Tom.